Good evening, everyone. I'm Brenda Hunt with the Battle Creek Community Foundation. I'm the president and CEO. And some of you know that in March 31st, with all the grace in the world, I'm going to go do something else. And so there's a lot of nostalgia going on for me at such a young age. Uh, I was looking through the program and uh, this is actually the 35th year of the Sherman B. Winslow MD lectureship. And I have been, I've had the wonderful presence to be at 33 of them throughout history. And uh, earlier today, uh, you will remember this, I was explaining to a staff member who Tom Sullivan was. And I was, I was 32 to be exact when he came and it was right after the hospitals had merged and there had been a movie about his life. It was called, If You Could Hear, If You Could See What I Can Hear, because he's blind. Uh, uh, comedian, author, singer, you know, and all these things, but he was circa the late 70s. He's 77 years old. The staff person acted as if they were amused that I could recite that. And then uh, we had to have a, a, a black Lincoln to pick him up and take him around. And I got to drive him to the airport. He did not know about my driving record at the time and that I had several speeding tickets from that end. But, and then I looked back and I looked at Leland Kaiser, right? the late Leland Kaiser, and one of the most uh, prominent healthcare consulting firms in the United States and perhaps the world. So as I reflected back on this, I looked and thought about how we how we leaned in, how we reached, right? It seemed simpler back in those days. And then I started looking at some of these and there's one about infectious disease. There's none on here that predicted a pandemic from all along those lines. But I just think about Valkyrie and how we always have had this opportunity of how we've reached higher than we are with ourselves. And I just think the Winslow Lectureship uh, is a wonderful tribute to a profession uh, in the healthcare industry that I will always salute and look up to uh, from, from my standpoint. And this lectureship is a very important part and we'll continue. We've got the next two or three set up but tonight will be my last night as the CEO of the Battle Creek Community Foundation and employee of the Battle Creek Community Foundation. But I'm not giving up 30 years of being involved in healthcare in this community. So I've committed to stay on the Bronson board. They think I might still be useful uh, on the big board. Um, we work with community partners, which is for Bill Winslow as the board chair. And in this building is Senior Care Partners Pace. And uh, we capitalize that program here in Battle Creek. It's the largest tenant in this building. The Community Foundation owns this building. And it serves a large region. And there's a lot of history that's very important to us. So I just committed to go on to that board. So as I figure out what I'm going to do next, I want to stay here. And I want to stay involved. So I'll be attending the Winslow Lectureship, hopefully, in the future. But tonight is just a delightful moment of reflection. And my thought pattern tonight is about reaching. I would always in Valley Creek reach bigger and greater than we are, perhaps. I had, uh, they were doing my position listing. And it's, it's five pages long, it looks pretty professional. Uh, from that standpoint, with a professional can call, um, consult, and they call Battle Creek a nice town. And, and we never call ourselves a nice town, we are a city, all right? We're a metropolitan area and we have some of the best world class components here. And I was watching the senior management staff knock that out of the out of the description for somebody that they would uh, be so kind to recruit here to fulfill what will be a wonderful leadership opportunity at the Battle Creek Community Foundation. My years are undescribable uh, from a standpoint of the grace and the wonder and the beautiful thing that I've seen people do. Earlier this week, one of our former our spouses, who was a, a longtime physician, he's been passed away for three years. Her professional advisor called. She lives over on the north, uh, northeast of here, out of the state, because she's just thinking she would want to do a scholarship here in Battle Creek that's uh, medically oriented. And so we'll continue to work on that. 
That's the kind of grace, the kind of people, and the platform for which I step, which is and has been an incredible life. So thank you all, Winslow, and thank you, WMF, for the residency here. And while changes will take place, this community will prevail because one of the most important things, maybe more important right now than ever, is access to health care, particularly for our children, and quality care, and keeping a place up the street that our citizens can get to when they're in need. So my pledge and my thank you to everybody, all the physicians, all the assistants, the nurses, everybody who works in the profession that I've got the opportunity to meet and be around all these years. And the Winslow Lectureship is alive and well and will continue to help you reach to make this community even better in the delivery and access to our care for our people. So with that, I wanna introduce Angela Myers, one of the smart, brilliant people at the Community Foundation. She's a senior officer. She has three or four titles. We won't bring up her risk management title. We'll just tonight say that she's run the uh, population health care, better known as Regional Health Alliance, which started in 1999. She's headed up that work. It's alive and well for at least 10 years with us, along with five or six other things to be added on to her job description. So I'm very pleased that Angela Myers is an officer with the Battle Creek Community Foundation, one of our talented staff that will continue that leadership. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Brenda. And it has been completely an honor on my behalf to be able to work with you for so many years on the health piece and all the health um, aspects throughout the community with Population Health Alliance and how we're able to bring our different collaborative bodies together to really work on different issues that we see outside in the community um, from access to care to maternal and infant health to even our five C's also known as the Connecting Communities Cancer Care Coalition um, and so it's just been great to do that work and, and have an opportunity as well as now connecting with Dr. Spellberg and um, all the folks at WMED to bring this excellent program here. So um, as Brenda mentioned, I, I serve in many roles with the Battle Creek Community Foundation, but one of them is the director of the Population Health Alliance. We have a few staff here. We have Rod Otten over there at the door, as well as Cicely McLaughlin here. Um, that hopefully at some point you all can connect with if there's anything that you would like to get involved in in our uh, our health work. Um, we've had a great partnership with WMED over the years, and tonight is no different as we bring another Sherwood B. Winslow lectureship to the community. Tonight, I get the honor of introducing Dr. Solberg. <coughs> He completed his family medicine residency training at the University of Michigan. Following eight years of rural practice in Arizona, he moved to full-time teaching and established a family medicine skin care and procedures clinic while at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Stahlberg is currently a professor and chair for the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Western Michigan University Palmer Stryker MD School of Medicine. He has published numerous journal articles, case publications, chapters, and books about skin care and family medicine. Once again, it has been great to work with you, and I'm looking forward to the talk tonight. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Stolberg. Step away from the podium because I'm Mike also. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you, Cicely and Brenda and Bill and um, Rod and also Marcy, who is behind the scenes, who helped all of these people help to put this together uh, so that we can come here and be together for this wonderful evening. And I'll be talking about, uh, let's see. Great. Okay. So we're going to talk about skin cancer. We're going to talk about examinations, how we treat those things. And then we're going to talk about some of the things that happened during the pandemic and some of the fun things that we experimented with during the pandemic. And then we'll see how we're going to do after, after the pandemic. So for those of you who want to see a neat credit, here is the information. We'll put up a slide at the end also. 
uh, regarding that. And also, I believe there might be some evaluation forms on the table. And we also have a little link for evaluation at the end that I'll show at the end in case you would like to give us some feedback suggestions uh, to help make everything better for us all in the future. So I have no disclosures uh, in terms of financial obligations, uh, conflicts of interest. We are accredited for physicians, and nurses, and social workers to get credit for this evening. And we're going to talk about a little bit about doing skin cancer examinations and also some recommendations to reduce the likelihood of additional skin cancers in the future. There's been a couple of things that have changed for that. Uh, you'll become aware of some of the options that we have for treating pre-cancers. And we'll talk a little bit about treating skin cancer. Now, I know we've got a whole range of talents here in terms of some people who've been, uh, people who've had to have pre-cancers and cancer treated, and some people who treat skin cancer. So keep, keep that in mind. So whenever we talk about uh, anything medical, we always want to know, well, how did it start? Is it changing? What symptoms do you have? And these are some of the questions that we ask people that help us get a sense for what's been going on with their spots. Now, especially with skin cancers, a lot of times they don't heal, so they tend to ulcerate. So those are concerning things for us. There are some people who have a higher risk of skin cancers. So people who've personally had skin cancers before, or people who have, uh, I think the next slide, I talked about family history, but we ask, we ask if they've had melanoma skin cancer, and then there's the non-melanoma skin cancers, uh, if they've had previous similar problems, and then there are certain people who are at very high risk based on their medical conditions. So people who uh, have had solid organ transplants, like kidney transplants, because of the immune suppressing drugs that they're on, so they don't reject their new kidney, that also blunts their ability to fight off new skin cancers. So those people, it's recommended to do annual skin cancer examinations for them, or more often if they've got active skin cancers going on. So methotrexate is another medicine that blunts the immune system to cancer chemotherapy. People with uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia also are higher risk for skin cancers. So for those people, those people can go to shut up, get an annual skin examination, now, the statistics say that not everybody should have one. Anybody who has a concern should get a thorough skin examination, and these people should definitely get thorough skin examinations on a regular basis. Other people pick up some extra sun exposure. So we would talk with people who was a roofer for 10 years or 20 years, and we thought it was really cool to take off our shirts and we always you know, get that first burn of the year and then they just get brown. Okay, those people are at high risk, you know, for where they got all that sun exposure. When people look, uh, have said, oh yeah, I used to go to the tanning salon. It's like, do I need a head and toe examination? It's like, well, what did you wear when you were in the little tanning bed? If nothing, it's like, okay, we better check all over because in just one visit to the tanning salon increases the risk of skin cancer. So those people also wore a little bit of extra uh, care and see on the seat. Family history I mentioned before. So if somebody's had a family history of melanomas or precancers or mm -hmm. uh, non-melanoma skin cancers, those would be basal cell and squamous cell, uh, their kids are at higher risk for skin cancers also. Some of the people, like I mentioned, the tanning salon people or the people who are at high risk because of previous uh, immune suppression, those people, I really encourage them to do head to toe skin examinations when they come in to see us in the office. Some of them are not comfortable with that and they only want to remove some of their clothing. So I encourage them, it's like, well, any parts that we didn't look at today, it's like, please go home, get out the mirror or two mirrors if you need to, check very thoroughly. And if you find something that doesn't look perfectly normal, come on back and then we'll check that. But of course, we never want to make somebody do what they don't want to do. And then there are people like, the, you know, it's like, no, I worked on the farm, but I never took my shirt off or anything like that. For some of those people, we're going to just evaluate the higher risk areas unless we see some indication that we need to do more. So, you know, the arms, the face, the hands, that's where we see most of our skin cancer. Of course, we see about where it goes the highest one. So, for the, I give this a similar talk to um, residents, medical students practicing physicians. So I talk with them about, you know, having gowns and drapes, 
because uh, we do um, an extra light magnification. And I'll show you uh, some slides about dermatoscope later. That's kind of a fun instrument that we're using more and more over time. Another thing that I'd like to do is many of you who have pre cancers know that the skin gets rough. And so I actually ask my patients before I start cutting their skin, I say, may I touch your forehead? May I touch the back of your hands? Because a lot of these things you can't see uh, as well as you can feel. So you start feeling the back of the hands and the arms. And then I show them, it's like, you feel this rough area here? It's like, well, I've got a cat. So, okay. So if it does, if it goes away, that's great. It was just the scratches from the cat. But these look like pre cancer. So it gets the sandpapery rough texture. And I like to impart with so, so after we treat them, it's like, if you start getting those rough things again, come back and we'll take care of those. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. So I do encourage my residents and students to touch people's skin after they seek permission to do that. It can be very helpful. So you know, I'm not gonna talk about how I go through a skin examination, but basically it's very thorough. Um, for the medical people uh, in the office, I'll share one uh, tip. For the men, when I do their examinations, because I you know, I have to deliver babies, I've done vasectomies, I'm comfortable looking at everything. Um, for the men, usually I'm not wearing gloves. I always have them like, lift up your penis, you know, move your scrotum side to side so I can see everywhere. I do roll people over and it's like, okay, can I show you butt cheeks? But, but they can't see the backside. We find some interesting things. Um, you can hide cancers in lots of different places. We see mold between people's toes. We're spreading those also and looking everywhere. Okay. Trogon melanoma follow up patients. Melanoma is the serious type of skin cancer. That's the one that people die from because it can metastasize. So, for those individuals, in addition to checking their skin to make sure they don't have any new melanomas or a recurrence of their melanoma, we also check their lymph nodes. So, we're checking under the arms and in the groin and in the neck to make sure they don't have lymph nodes. And of course, cancers can spread to the liver and spleen, so we'll do an abdominal exam on them also. I think we've covered enough of this. Let's keep going. So now we'll talk about what we do when we found something interesting. So which one of these is, is cancer? Kind of a trick question. They're both, it's the same person. So this is what, um, and it was a superficial basal cell. Let me go back here. So over there on the right, you see the tip of my thumb. If you stretch the skin on some of these skin cancers, get a branch. So you can see from the hair pattern, that's exactly the same spot. But over on the left, that's barely perceptible. But when you stretch the skin tight, it all of a sudden makes it so much easier to see that real pale area there in the middle. So that can be helpful in terms of those of you that are diagnosing patients um, that you know normal skin stretches well and normal skin that's not stretches well. So many of you have seen people, friends, patients who have things like this. Everybody knows this is what's the top of the thing? It's a skin cancer, right? Okay. So this one particular one shows some of the common features that we look for. It's got extra blood vessels, which medically we call hemorrhagic cases. Some people call them rolled borders. So you've got those rounded rolled borders and then that central ulceration there uh, in the middle. So that was a nodular basal cell cancer uh, on a mature woman there, right in the middle of her forehead. It had been there for about a year. These things generally grow pretty slowly. She called it her third eye because it's right there. Um, we took care of that for her. Now on this one, This is interesting because some people say, do you need to do a biopsy or can you just treat these things? Can you identify and just treat? I typically am doing a biopsy in most of these first to find out specifically what type of cancer it is. This is the, the back of an older woman's hand. And this uh, shows erosions and some ulceration and scale on this. And this is actually what's called a basosclamus. So it actually has features of a basal cell plus the squamous cell, and that makes it an even higher risk cancer. And there's a special process called most micrographic surgeries. So these higher risk lesions, they tend to spread out where you can't see it as well clinically. So if I had just treated it like a basal cell, 
uh, I would have done the wrong treatment. I would not have done as accurate a surgical procedure as the most microbiotic surgeon. So what they would do is they would estimate where this cancer goes and they would cut that out and with a little bit of a margin around it. And then they flash freeze it and look at it underneath the microscope right then while the patient's in the room with a little wet gauze on the hole in their hand. And they look at it underneath the microscope and they've marked it. So it's like around the face of the clock. So if they say, because they've got a clock over there. So if they say, okay, from 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock, we still see cancer. They're going to come back and they're going to take another slice from 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Look at it again. And they say, oh my God, there's still a little bit at 2 o'clock. And they'll take a little bit more at 2 o'clock. And then they look at it and they say, okay, we've looked at the entire periphery, the entire margin, everything is good. And then they look at the hole that they've got left. Sometimes they get very large. And then they figure out how to patch that back together. So these high risk, there are a few high risk lesions. And the theory of ugly is if you have an older person and they've got something ugly on their skin, it's cancer, it's all proven otherwise. <laughs> so these are kind of fun. These are dermatoscopes, and, and I brought mine when I go, I don't wear it every day, but when I go to clinics, I have a dermatoscope. And this is, you know, it's for people who take care of skin, it's like a stethoscope. Um, we just carry these around. It uh, has polarized light and magnification. And in this day and age, we actually can attach them to our cell phones now. So it just magnetically attaches to the cell phone. So when I've got a patient who comes in and they say, oh, I've got this ugly thing on my back. My wife said, I got to get it checked out. I'll take a picture on my phone with what's like 10 times magnification. Uh, so it's bigger. I've got extra light and I've got polarizing. Uh, light with the filter on it so I can actually see deeper in. And I'll show you some pictures about that. And that gives me more information about these lesions. And I can show the person, as I took a picture of the spot on the back, I'll come out front. So this is what I'm worried about. It's like, okay, it's got the army yellow pattern. That's just a craggy age spot. I'm not worried about that. Yes, it's ugly, but it's not cancer. The other ones, it's like, ooh, this one I'm worried to get my cancer. So these have been fun, uh, and these we do have uh, at a great South Clinic here and then the Clinic here in Battle Creek. So this is what some of those things look like with extra magnification. The little ruler over here, each one of those little lines is one millimeter. So you get to really blow it up big crazier. So you can see the abnormal pigment and the scale there. Uh, the one on the right is a basal cell cancer. The one on the left is looking more like a squamous cell cancer with that scale appearance to it. They don't, uh, and there's different features. We're not going to get into too much detail of that tonight. In terms of how we manage basal cell skin cancers, so there's a range of treatments that you can do uh, for these. Um, there's something called electrodesiccation and curatage. It's a scrape and burn procedure. The reason why we like that is pretty easy to do and quickly in the office, and you don't lose acreage. Uh, so if you've got a spot that you cut out with a scalpel, you start to lose acreage. Uh, for this, most of these cancers develop in the interface between the epidermis and the dermis. So the epidermis is the outer layer of skin. The dermis is the thick part. Uh, it's what they make leather out of the cows, the dermis. So that's the thick part. So most of these are very superficial. So you can use a special instrument and just scrape down to that interface and scrape off all the cancer. So for these early ones, that's a nice way to treat it. There are also some topical medications. Uh, amiglomod is an immune system booster. So it helps your body kick out the cancer. So that's an option. And then 5 fluorouracil uh, otherwise known as Epidex, is a topical chemotherapy. So it blocks cell reproduction. So things that are metabolized and faster, like cancers, get hurt a lot more than regular skin cells. So that can be very effective. Also, those take six weeks or so for those uh, treatments. So straight and burn, we, just, we do two cycles, but we do it in the office at one visit. So it's a little faster. There are options, and you get to choose based on where it is on the body and what type of mark you might end up leaving after those. Nodular basal cells are the little ones that grow up and get thicker. If they're small, we can do the straight and burn. Otherwise, fill it called invasive, and we'll go ahead and we'll typically cut those out with the scalp uh, in the office. So this is the instrument there on the left that we do for the scraping. Uh, this side is flat, the other side has a blade, a scraping blade on it. And you scrape across the surface there. 
Um, and you go around the face of the clock. You can say, I have a learner with it. It's kind of fun because the touch just left those circles around the face of the clock as they were doing this great procedure. And then we cauterize it over there on the right hand side. And then we scrape it again. And the nice thing about the scraping procedure is basal cell cancers are kind of mushy. So as you scrape, they'll actually, you'll scrape off and say, oh my gosh, it's not a perfect circle. It goes off in one direction or another. So you can actually feel and follow where those cancers are. So that's one of the nice aspects of that. High risk areas. The most micrographic surgery is great for the high risk areas and also the ones where you don't want to take off some of these whole nodes. Okay, so they can keep the margins closer because they can actually examine the margins. If I'm supposed to take off, if I'm going to take off something, I usually have to take off a five millimeter within the tissue to be safe because I'm just going to send it off to the pathologist to get an answer in three days' time. So the most micrographic surgeons can address these high risk areas because cancers like on the nose or the ears tend to get into the cartilage, right along the cartilage, and then they can dive along the cartilage planes and it's hard to see where they go. So the most micrographic surgery is very important for these high risk areas around the eyes, around the mouth, around the nose, the ears, large lesions, and then some of the special types. And here's a, for those of you who want to know the special types that are high risk where you can uh, take a picture of those and then I'll move on. And some people call it an H zone of the face instead of a T zone, just different style. Okay, so this is an older gentleman who comes in. Uh, I, my patients, I draw on my patients a lot. Some of them come in and they've been drawn on by their significant others. Oh, have this one check out. So we write notes. This one's okay. Let's send them home with those notes for their significant other. So when we're looking at this, um, does anybody know what I've circled over there? I do reward audience participation. <laughs> you guys are quiet. These are um, read into shopping bags. <laughs> I know there's some metal types over here. What are we looking at here? The little rock white spots. AKs. Okay, so actin here comes these AKs. What else do we see? Maybe I can point it out. What's over there? So actinic keratosis are precancers. What do precancers do? Over time, they become cancer. So about 10% over 10 years is one estimate. There's some studies that show even a higher uh, rate of turning into cancer. So it's gone from the pre-cancers to this one, which is a little bit bigger, a little bit thicker. It's got more red to it. And so this is called Bowen's disease. And it's the next phase, squamous cell carcinoma, which is called in situ, not invasive yet. So there's a little close up of that for you. So now, what do we have here? Yeah, thank you. So now we've gone, if it were just that little white scale in the middle, we'd say pre-cancer. But again, over time, that's gotten more. And so that red area around it, now that's invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Now invasive squamous cell carcinoma, that's what they do. That's still not a high-risk lesion. So that's something we can do in the office. And that one we would cut all the way around it and then sew it back up. Um, Infiltrative is different. Infiltrative is like a spine network, and infiltrative cancers, those go to my like, most micrographic surgery colleagues because those can spread out and don't know where they stop. So, this is an uh, image, this is dermoscopy, and uh, that's, so that's that special magnification that we do, and it, it looks a whole different than if you're just looking at it with, uh, with your eyes without having this instrument. So you can see over here on the right, the scale, and then you get a sense with that pink and white, that scar-like tissue there, and often we'll see little red polka dots and abnormal blood vessels with this. So that's a squamous cell uh, cancer there. Uh, here we see the red polka dots, we call them truncation or uh, on there, and those red polka dots are abnormal blood vessels. So when you get abnormal skin growing, it scrunches the blood, blood vessels into abnormal patterns, and with this special instrument, we can see that. So you've got scale, scar, polka dot, blood vessel, squamous cell carcinoma right there. And this one, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, this is what's called keratoacanthoma type of squamous cell carcinoma. 
people, he looked at that, it's like, well, how could somebody let that get that big before they came in for evaluation? The usual story is, Doc, this wasn't here three months ago. These things grow incredibly quickly. Um, and they usually have that little keratin plug uh, in the middle, that reddish crusted tissue in the middle. So um, mostly we see these on the hands uh, and on the face. You can see them on the legs also. Um, but these grow very quickly, and I'll show you a picture of how we treat these later. But it is just amazing how they take that. Treatment options for actinic keratosis. We already talked about not all of them are going to be going on to cancer. So if you've got somebody who's got some other cancer or they've got heart failure, they're not going to be alive in two years, you may not want to bug them with treating their pre-cancer. Just leave them alone if they're not too bad. Um, but if you want to treat them, cryosurgery is fun to do as a physician. Not as much fun if you're the patient. It stings, it burns. Um, it's like, if, yeah, I tell them it's feel so cold that it's going to feel like it burns or stings. Um, but 95% uh, efficacy in terms of getting rid of precancers. Now, the nice thing, this is more for the medical types. The nice thing about freezing, actually, it's good for everybody. The nice thing about freezing is there's still some infrastructure after you freeze. So I tell people it's like a steel, uh, steel girder skyscraper. 1920s bill, okay? the pipes have gotten a little slow. It doesn't have cable TV or ISDN cable or fast internet or anything like that. It's looking a little shabby. They'll strip it down to the girders and they'll rebuild it. New drywall, new glass. It's bright, it's shiny, it looks new, but the shape is the same. Same thing we get with cryosurgery when we freeze these things. It can change the color. And, and it looks a little bit different from the color, but it doesn't usually cause scars. So that's why freezing these lesions is often nicer than scraping or burning for just the precancers. So this is an example of us using a liquid nitrogen spray gun. And again, I draw on my patients because some of these I could see, some I could feel, but it's easier for me if I draw on them. I do it generally the race the game before they go home. Uh, and then we just zap. So I started at the bottom. We zap those lesions and when I'm after I freeze the one on the top, we'll come back and freeze uh, a second cycle. I usually do a freeze, thaw, and a freeze because that causes uh, the amount of damage that I want. These typically get red before they leave. You can see a little red blanch here. They don't usually blister till after they're out of the office. Sorry. Um, but that blistering splits the layers of skin and it gets rid of those precancers, which are pretty superficial. So it's a little case of frostbite that we can do in the office. Other ways of managing this, uh, five, I've already spoken with a few people here who've talked about that cream, and we'll talk about that cream, 5 fluorouracil the Epidex, uh, which inhibits the DNA and RNA. So that's how it helps to kill off these lesions. Lots of different protocols. I usually do it twice a day for two weeks protocol until they're red, raw, and ugly. And it's not like the clear silk commercials where you just do the little dot and make the ones that go away. We call it field treatment or field therapy. You want to do entire blocks of area where the skin is abnormal, where they've got precancers, and they've got other precancers that haven't come to the surface yet. So this is field therapy for the people who have lots of them. Somebody comes in, they've got three spots, I'm going to freeze three spots. Somebody comes in, I tell them it's like taking care of a lot. If you have three dandelions, you pull three dandelions. If you've got three in the lines per square yard, you've got to read feed the whole yard. So likewise, if they've got 10 precancers on their forehead, 10 on each cheek, 20 on each arm, we're going to go out and read and feed the whole thing. So they apply it all over those areas till it's red, raw, and ugly, and then we let it heal in, and then we'll move on to another area. The reason why I like this is up to 90% complete clearance. Okay, it's, It is an investment. It's not a happy thing to go through. Okay. So this is somebody who's a week after treatment, and I have them do it on the forehead and scalp, and they're, this is a week after treatment, okay? They were even more red and uncomfortable a week ago. Now, Vaseline can help decrease some of the stain, yeah. which does get pretty irritated. Um, I was talking with a colleague. Um, I know of two medicines so far. They keep trying to find something that doesn't cause as much inflammation, and they have. But they don't work as well. You need to cause the inflammation to get rid of the, at least so far, you need to cause the inflammation to get rid of these three cancers. 
So other things, somebody knowing that they had this photodynamic therapy, some people say it was a worse sunburn I've ever had. Um, for people who know that they're not going to do something twice a day for two weeks, with photodynamic therapy is an option. I was kind of surprised that the statistics only showed like 38% complete skin clearance. I thought it was much more effective than that. So it is an option out there. I wish it were a little bit more effective, but that is an option. Now, we've also got Aldera, the immune stimulant uh, that boosts your immune system. So that can work. It takes about four months. Um, so I don't use that as much. Uh, we've got diclofenac gel. Some of you might be using that for your arthritis also. It's the same thing. Um, and that also, it takes 60 to 90 days. And we're looking at clearance rates in the 50%, you know, 55 to 58%. Okay. So, uh, Ingenol Picado is about $1,000 for a little tube. That one's been discontinued. Uh, discontinued. Uh, latest one, Clisiri, again, really expensive. And some of these newer medicines are only approved. Now, doctors can do things that aren't approved by the FDA, but it's only approved to be used for about two inches by two inches. You saw the guy's forehead, that's a lot bigger than two inches by two inches. So if you're following the books, you're not supposed to use that for big area. Another option, there's a medicine that we use for psoriasis called Globinex. Talks of trying the other name. And if you combine this medicine with that high chlorouracil, you only use it for four days. And then the inflammation starts after they're done. So they, they still get the inflammation, but that's not bad. 73% clearance. That's pretty good. I haven't started doing that um, because I don't really want a prescription of step two, but that is an option. Take home message from this. I go, even though it's ugly, I go with the most effective, just get it done. And then I have them come back after they've done the treatment. And then I freeze whatever's left over. So this is a gentleman who uh, shared some photographs. So he first started on his forehead. Now I have seen people who've been read, you know, there are a whole of, of the colleagues, he was in a conference. He was, he sent an email and apologized to everybody. He said, I'm so sorry. I was just not behaving well because I was just so miserable. And he had done his entire face and scalp, and he was just so miserable. So I generally do segments. So if somebody has it on their arms and hands, it's like, okay, well, let's start with one hand and one arm. We did some practice on that. After that one starts to heal, then do the other arm. Now, after you know what this is going to do to you, then let's go ahead and start on your forehead. Then let's do your nose and your cheeks. Then let's go ahead and do your ears. And they tolerate that a little better. So you can see how pretty this forehead is over there on the right. Look how nice that's looking. You know, he's so smooth now. And people love it. It's oh, smooth again. Um, and that can be wonderful. And now he's working on mid face because, you know, it's like it's like rust in Michigan on the cars, right? If you got rust on the front portal panel, you better check the back. Um, <laughs> because we've all been through the same 100,000 miles at this point. Yeah. Um, there are some inflammatory conditions. You need to control those before you use this anti-metabolite medicine. I'll just go through that. So what can you do to reduce the uh, chance of additional cancers? We recommend avoiding the midday sun, or not just the baseball cap, but you want to wear that broad brim uh, hat so that you can um, avoid the sun exposure on your face. The sun protective clothing, for those of you who like to shop at Costco or big box stores, for $15 or $20, you can get sun protective long sleeve shirts. Um, they look just fine, and they don't have to put sunscreen all over. They say that you're supposed to use like two ounces of sunscreen if you really go to the beach with just a bathing suit, uh, two ounces. So that's a huge amount. It's like a shot glass full of sunscreen that you're supposed to use every time. And then if you towel off, you're supposed to reapply. And if you go in the water, then you're supposed to reapply. Or you can wear one of those sun protector shirts. I've got a couple of them, so I'm pretty religious about doing that. And I've got my big broad broom hat uh, that I use, uh, and those things can be helpful with reducing the amount of impact of the sun. Now, yes, before we knew about that, people have had decades of sun exposure. Now, one of the nice things is uh, there are chemical sunscreens and there are also mineral sunscreens. So the titanium uh, oxide and the zinc oxide it's not as bad as it used to be. So remember the lifeguards who had the white zinc oxide, which is 
fully white, just like these tablecloths. So now we've got micronized uh, titanium oxide and zinc oxide, and it looks milky, but it doesn't look totally white. Now, but what happens if you have somebody who's got dark skin and you put something that looks milky white on them? It doesn't look so good. So now they've got tinted sunscreens, and they actually have um, uh, different colors on these tinted sunscreens. Uh, and so they blend in a lot nicer. People won't see that you've got sunscreen on, and they work very well um, because it's a mineral blocking the sun. So those are nice. Well, let's get into something new. How many people have heard of niacin? Okay, this is a little bit different. Niacin causes flushing. We used to use it for triglyceride, elevated triglycerides. This is nicotinamide, and sometimes we call niacinamide. So it's in the vitamin D family, and this helps the skin repair itself. And there has been a few studies now that show that if you take this vitamin, so you get it, it's not a prescription. I typically can't find it in the regular grocery stores, regular drug stores. Usually it's a vitamin specialty store, or I can get it off the internet. So that's a six cent tablet. One of these 500 milligrams twice a day reduced uh, the chances of precancers by about 15% and cancers by 23% over the course of the year. So I'm prescribing this, I'm recommending this for all of my patients who've had skin cancers or precancers. Um, it's easy to take, it does not cause the flushing. I've had three people who complained of flushing after I recommended this, and I said, bring this stuff in. And I looked at the bottle because they went to the store and somebody grabbed niacin for them off the shelf. So you do want to make sure that you get the nicotinamide or niacinamide, not niacin, because you want the right stuff, and niacin makes people unhappy. So let's see, we're talking about management of squamous cell carcinoma. So I showed you that broad patch of mild cancer. So we'll scrape and burn those. There's another one. That one can be scraped and burned. It's a quick, easy procedure in the office. Uh, the invasive twin cell cancers, we'll cut those out with a scalpel. And then the high risk ones, we already mentioned those micrographic surgery. Now, this is another, just like the back of that uh, gentleman's hand, this is a woman who has one of those carotid cancers. Now, there was debate for a while whether they were actually cancers or not, because if you leave them alone long enough, they sometimes go away. They leave a nasty scar. So the debate is like, is it really a cancer? Because a lot of them go away. Um, we do consider it a cancer, but it's somewhat more indolent. It's not as aggressive as most cancers. So for one of these, I'll take a scalpel. So upper left is the way it looks. Upper middle, I'll take a scalpel, just cut the base, uh, cut it right off the base, send it to the pathologist, tell them what I'm looking for. Because if they tell me it's invasive swing with cell cancer, then I have to go back and cut around it. But if they confirm that it's this special type of swing with cell cancer, um, then my treatment is to cut off the bulk of it, scrape the base with that thread, and then I go ahead and I put uh, some Vaseline on it. But you can see over here, bottom left, as I'm scraping, this looks better than we can in them. That's after we cut the thing off because it just doesn't go that deep. It is there, it is real, but this is the one exception where I typically do the whole treatment uh, the same day that they come in. Okay. Radiation, if somebody can't tolerate regular skin surgery, then there's an option of radiation therapy. There is a protocol for freezing skin cancers. If a long freeze, you have to numb people up. It ends up more than just blistering. It destroys the skin, so they end up weeping. So I don't do that, but that is an option. I'm going to switch over to melanoma stuff. Um, do people need to stretch a little bit or ask a question before we do melanoma stuff? No? Do we need to turn down? Is it getting warm? Okay. <laughs> Not for you. Any other question here? Are you taking a question right now? I'll take a question, yes. Question with regards to um, chemicals. I have a question regarding uh, skin um, protection with chemicals such as titanium dioxide and zinc oxide versus some of the chemicals. And it's somewhat confusing to me because um, there were reports that some of the chemical agents a couple of years ago that are used in uh, 
to prevent the UVA and UVB from getting in your skin and get absorbing the body and maybe causing some problems. And as I, as I recall, wasn't there a problem with coral reefs being damaged too? Um, I mean, if it's bad for the coral reefs, I wonder what it does to the human body. But my, my question is, if you were to apply titanium dioxide versus zinc oxide, is it correct that those substances are really not absorbed into the body as opposed to the chemical agents that you see in the drugstore? Can you clarify that one? So actually, you've done a wonderful job of clarifying all of the aspects of it. You are right that there are some the, the, the avobenzones, cyclobenzones, or some of the chemicals that you see in the, what they call the chemical sunscreens that block the sun's light. And so some of those, uh, like you go to Hawaii, they won't let you use those because it may cause damage to the corals. You're totally right on that. Yes, there's concern that some of those chemicals may be toxic if you get enough of them into your system. Of course, you wouldn't use them on people less than six months old because the babies have thinner skin and also they've got more surface area and some volume uh, than adults. So for them, you just wrap them up and keep them out of the sun. Um, so you're right, there's concern about absorption. Could those chemicals be toxic? And that's why some people prefer uh, the mineral ones that just stay on the surface and aren't kind of sort of you did a wonderful job of summarizing all of us. Well it is confusing it's, uh, you know even if you're not a baby <laughs> yeah I don't think anybody wants to take chemicals and resistance. Exactly if you don't need it. You did a great job. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, molds and melanoma. So the American Cancer Society their goal is to yeah. 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 yes please so I'm a frequent flyer for all this stuff other than this. And I've had a blue U, which I think is one of the procedures you just described, where the chemicals applied and then you wait three or four hours. And then I've had that six or eight times and have it again on the scalp and on the face this autumn. Which one of the ones that you showed is that one? And is that the one with the 38 efficacy percentage? Yeah, so that's, you're exactly right. So that's the... Uh, photodynamic therapy, you take a sensitizer, it uh, gets into your system, and then the light so more selectively targets the area where the chemical was taken up into your skin. So you've had it, it, it it's, it, you can tell me, when you've had it, did it just make those little spots light up, or did it make those little spots light up, plus the areas around the golf cart? I think like you had the one gentleman who was the real deep red on the right, like that. And I've had it a couple of times in the summer, and I would definitely recommend anyone who has it have it done in the winter. Yeah. And because it definitely was uh, very painful and um, very limiting for a couple of days when I did it a couple of summers ago. Yeah, so you are exactly right. So that is an option in the study that I referred to. Yes, the efficacy in terms of complete clearance was listed as 38 percent so it is effective to a certain degree and it is out there it is an option and you get to choose along with your provider in terms of what to do is it wise to, i mean every two years or so i've had that is it wise to try something else or is it supposed to come when we have certain skin type as frequently as that? So you know, if you were to see me in the office, I would recommend that you take the nicotinamide to reduce the likelihood to help your skin heal itself. So I've written that down and highlighted it in the office. Great. It's easy. To, if you do Amazon, it's easy to find. Um, the, um, and, then in, and I do recommend that you continue seeing your provider. Um, typically, if you've got a lot of active stuff and every six months or more frequent, if everything is looking pretty stable, then once a year is the minimum frequency. Um, because people who have, so again, it's like that after you've hit the 100,000 miles and say you're starting to rust, there's going to be more. We're going to try and stay on top of it to treat those in the precancerous, whether you choose the cream, uh, which takes longer, or whether you choose the photodynamic uh, treatment. Those are both good options. Uh, so like I said, I, I don't, in my office, I don't have the photodynamic treatment. I'm going with the cream. Some people have that in their office, and so that's an extra tool to think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one more quick question. We'll talk about no, no, no. It's just a simple comment. A, a lot of these skin cancers, as I understand, are thought to be associated with ultraviolet 
light. Yes. And, um, you know, a lot of people, I have, I'm redhead, so I'm very sensitive to this, but anyways, uh, something you might, people might want to think about is uh, wearing uh, sunglasses in, in, in the, and particularly uh, when they're on water poles or a lot of light outside because cataracts, you might not be, you might have black hair, cataracts are thought to be associated, uh, a risk factor is all about a light. So, um, you know, I started finally getting some sunglasses and wearing them, but it's amazing how much, uh, um, and, and, you know, no matter what my optometrist said, you can see what shoot me, but uh, okay. polar, polarized light, polarized lenses don't block ultraviolet light. Um, you need actually some, you know, you know, material in the plastic or the glass or whatever, but um, even if you're not fair skin like myself, if everybody, if you can see, is at risk of cataracts, and it's true that ultraviolet light is the risk factor. A lot of people should probably, should probably be using sunglasses to block ultraviolet light to reduce our cataracts. You are spot on, right? Yeah. So, uh, our eye doctor colleagues do worry about the cataracts and sunglasses. Uh, they recommend sunglasses to reduce the light of them. So, the American Cancer Society, much like some of our colleagues, are we doing okay on time? Okay. So, the um, their, their goals is to help people with either diagnose or manage their cancers. So they developed the ABCDE rules for how to uh, evaluate moles, whether it's worrisome or not. So A would be asymmetry, border, are the borders irregular? Uh, C, colors, I say of the United States, black, red, white, blue, or black, or more than one color in the same spot. B would be diameter bigger than six millimeters, which is about as big as a standard pencil eraser. Uh, e would be if it's elevated around above the surrounding skin or part of it's elevated, or if it's changing, evolving over time. So let's practice on this one. Is it asymmetric? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, it's got a thumb sticking out the top. Okay. Uh, borders, are the borders irregular? It's not a nice little round oval. Colors, are there more than one color? Great. And then this is, I usually try to throw rulers in when I take photographs. This is a millimeter ruler. Is it bigger than six millimeters? And it's longest dimension. Over here, we're sitting. People should have been after it. And then E, you don't have the history to know whether it's evolving, but is, does it look like part of it's elevated? Right. So this could be a melanoma. We're going to take this off that same visit. Okay, as long as we're not too backed up. And if we can't take it off that same day, then we're going to want to make sure that we've got to follow up promptly to get this completely off as soon as we can, because we know that delays in care with melanoma increases the risk of spread and death from melanoma. How does this, what does this person have? Does that look bad? Does that look like when we talk about the ABCDEs? Looks a little raised. So I'm hearing it's like, yeah, it looks a little funny, but I'm not having people like jump up and down. It's a melt no, no, take off. Okay. Let's go to the dermatoscope on. Now everybody's saying it's like, oh my gosh, that looks terrible. Um, so that's just by putting that instrument that I carry around in clinic when I'm in clinic with you. Just take it out and we look at it. And now you can see it's got legs running down the bottom, it's spreading out here. Um, it's got it's supposed to you know, bulbs that are nice. They look like a volleyball net in terms of the pigment, but this one has extra dark lines instead of just uniform lines. And then up at the top where it's pale. So at the, top of the upper left, those that pigment network that was pretty uniform. That looks good. Down here on the bottom was like really dark and bad. And then that pinkish pale area, the body tries to heal itself and it tries to kick out abnormal cells. So that's what's called regression. So the body's trying to attack this melanoma. Not usually successful, but every once in a while we'll see melanomas disappear because the immune system will go after it. Sometimes you'll never find the primary melanoma because the body kicks it out, but it's still spread. And this is another one where it uh, is melanoma and it's the body's trying to eat away at it. And that gives it the irregular appearance and also cancer, they grow irregular. So that's why the uh, dermatoscopes are really helpful for something like this. So we get these off as quick as we can with a narrow margin, one millimeter. So that's just a thing if you're dying. The reason why we don't take big chunks is because if it's melanoma, we have to go in for a re-excision. We take out more 
to make sure it's clear. And when we measure how much more we're taking out, it's from the scar. So don't take out more than you need to start with, because if you do, the size of this re-excision ends up getting magnified. So uh, this is a little technical. I'm going to skip that. This is, again, a little technical, but it gives us the guidelines in terms of how thick the melanoma was tells us how big of a chunk we need to cut off afterwards. And if it's really thick, then we have special surgeons that will do lymph node biopsy. We call it a sentinel node biopsy. So it's be aware of that drain. So if it's like here, you know, on the tummy, my drain is pulling. If they inject it with radioactive uh, material and a tracer dye, so you can see where it went. Uh oh, how many? Okay, just went on that. Okay, so let's talk about the pandemic. So we've been through a well, once in a hundred years, hopefully once in a hundred years of pandemic. Uh, and we started to do a lot of telehealth uh, that talks about some of the healing. We're not sure what's going to happen at the end. Already, the rules are changing. We're going to see what happens at the end of the year, whether we can continue to do telehealth the way we've been doing it. Uh, we can do it by telephone. We can do it by video. And we used to send out, we still send out messages to patients. Can we do your telehealth with it? And I found that... Um, Photographs work better than a live telephone, although with the live telephone, you can do pretty good thorough skin examinations. And when everybody was staying at home and not going to the doctor's office, you know, we did everything that we could, right? Well, it's like by hook or by crook, we're going to get this done. People still get problems. So, focusing a smartphone, I tell people to. Start far out. They want to like put it right up next to it. So you know, we'll get blurry, blurry photos. Start away, and then you can get a little closer to maintain the focus. Don't use the selfie one. The selfie camera is not as good as what they call the forward-facing online. But we actually have, with the helper, like somebody needs a total body skin examination, if they've got a big smartphone, a forward-facing camera, and somebody to help, they actually can just like go over the whole area and we could get great images through the internet. Also, you can get even better quality by taking little snapshots and then sending them through the computer. And then we can look at them, we can pull them up on the computer and we can share the screen and show the patient what we're looking at and vice versa. Sometimes we'll say, it's like, oh, but I want us to look at this, all these things that I'm saying. So telehealth will actually work pretty well for uh, skin care. So this is just some of the examples that we have of some of the telehealth we did. So this is just one of those craggy age-related spots that's called the separated keratosis. And this is a group of photographs that a patient sent there. It's pretty good. About as good as mine, right? Okay. That's not precancerous. That's not precancerous. That one, yeah, that was our diamond dozen. Uh, they can take them off for cosmetic purposes. So more examples here. So this is another one of those craggy age spots called separated keratosis, SK for short. But this is an image that we got from the patient and we can just diagnose this to telehealth. Okay. What's this? Let me know what this is. They used a penny for size. Bug bite? Did you say bug bite? This is the bug bite. Okay. It's got that little pokey thing in the middle, the little central pumpkin that we call it medical. Okay. Many of you have had this. This is a kiddo who had these little bumps, and then I got some more. Who's Molluscum? Yeah. Chris, Molluscum, contagiosum, diagnosed through telehealth. Okay, now this one's a little less common. 13 year old with pace with uh, painful lesions on her legs. Do you know what this is? Who said everything in the Thank you so much. So erythema means red, and those means nodules. Um, so we diagnosed her over the phone. She doesn't even need to come in to the clinic for that. Okay. This one's a little tricky because it's sometimes hard to tell just by a photograph whether it's raised up or depressed. Uh, and when we spoke with the guy, he mentioned, you know, he could tell us that it was just flat. So this was just a little scar and not a basal cell skin cancer. Now, when we look at this, is this something we can just leave at home? No, you can't do everything through telehealth. This guy's got a suspicious dark spot on his lip. The lip is not very thick. So things on the lip tend to pass to size or go through quicker than other places where you have thicker skin. So this one needed to come in uh, for a biopsy on that. 
this is a guy who had melanoma, lots of skin cancer. So I said, okay, well, I want a picture, a frontal picture of your face. I'm on each side of your face. I want your arms. And so he just sent me a whole sequence of pictures. Okay. He's got, yeah, the arrows will punch you in the right direction. Right, that's interesting. Awesome. Okay. What do we have here? Same over here. Okay, actinic characteristics. Okay, and diffuse actinic chain. He looks like he's got a weak skin. Okay, right? he needs to have you that on his arm, which we can do with a prescription. Just send it to the pharmacy. Or they need to come to the office. We could treat this now to get to freeze the ones that are left over. Okay, now this is his face. He's got a nodular basal cell cancer. He didn't even need to come to the office. He's got a nodular basal cell cancer that's in a high risk area right next to his nose. Skip seeing me. I just send him straight to the mode of my street. You know, there's just this economy of how you, when you're in a pandemic and you need to be efficient about things, minimize the visits, you can do this stuff. But that was all diagnosed through telehealth. So I really have enjoyed telehealth. We even had some people healing their own lymph nodes. I, I talked about it. I spoon probably the better than that, you know, class <laughs> Okay. This is sort of craggy. This is just, this is a non cancer. It's a separate therapist. It's from stuck on rough spot. But people sent us great photographs. But somebody who said, well, if you want, how, what kind of tile size? Do you want 15 megabytes? All those? I can say to those, it's like, no, no. Keep it down to the bottom. Um, okay. Oh, this is interesting. This is not skin cancer. This is just the type of thing that we can do in terms of skin care. Alopecia area, exactly. So this is a young woman who's got that, that just uh, very circumscribed area of hair loss. So non-office-based treatment, as I mentioned, we can prescribe some of these things over the phone. Just this year, um, in terms of like skin tag tags, people say, can I use that work freezer stuff on my skin tags? In the past, I've had to say, well, I can't say you can, but apparently now you can. So now people can use these things and they can freeze their own stuff at home. It's not as cold as what we have in the office, so it's gonna take longer. Their success rates are not as good, but um, people are gonna freeze more and more stuff. And in Europe, they've been freezing their own things at home for a while now. So after the pandemic is gone, we're still, I think, going to use some telehealth. We'll have to see. People like to come in. No, people hate going to the doctor. I hate going to the doctor. Um, but they're willing to come in to see the physician. Um, but the telehealth is a nice extension. Let's say we've got somebody who needs that special oral medicine for acne. You can see them in the office getting started on the protocol, but you have to see them every month. So instead of pulling a parent from work, and pulling a teenager from high school, they can do a telehealth visit with you. And that just is much more efficient. Um, so I think there is a role for telehealth moving forward. Yeah, somebody also I read about, you know, can you work from the beach? If physicians and healthcare providers are working from the beach, please make sure you use your sunscreen, <laughs> your sunscreen clothing, and stay in the shade. But by all means, if you can pull it off, work from the beach, please do. I do know a PA who's been working from the beach for a long time now. Um, doing telehealth. So those are some of the things you can do. Um, Takeaway, um, I think you got a sense. My favorite topical medicine for treating precancers is the 5 chloro so the Acubex. I do it in segments, then I mop up the rest with the freezing treatment uh, in the office. And um, we talked about most micrographic surgery for the high-risk types of skin cancers in a high-risk location. Any recurrence needs to go to a most micrographic surgeon because they can get your highest rate of cure, 99% cure rates in the, in the hands of a good most micrographic surgeon. Niacinamide, otherwise known as nicotinamide, 500 milligrams twice a day. Um, I have not, other than the people who got the niacin, I have not had anybody yet that I know of get side effects from that. It is in the vitamin B family. Um, so your body can urinate off extra vitamin B if you've got too much vitamin B. And we talked about some connection here. So my email is there if anybody wants that. We do have the activity code and we do have the feedback. Um, so anybody who needs that in case they want to see any credit, and then I'm going to leave this one up. 
So if you care to use your smartphone and just put the camera out and point it at that, uh, you'll get a flag with a yellow thing and you tap on that and it will take you to an internet site where you can give us feedback about today's presentation. You can also give us suggestions for future presentations. And I want to thank you, but I also want to see if there are other questions before we wrap up. Any questions? Go for it. Uh, last week, I listened to a talk on breast cancer treatment. I think it was breast cancer month recently. And uh, there's a lot of changes going on in trying to screen women for early breast cancer. And it's interesting how the technology is changing. Um, and the reason I'm talking, asking the question I'm asking is um, apparently some of the big companies like GE who are into this and other companies are now taking all these mammograms they're doing and placing that information in computer systems. You know, we've all heard about this AI revolution that's coming about and are actually coming out with uh, systems that, that appear to be able to diagnose uh, uh, mammogramic finding of a cancer very, very early. My question to you is, many years ago, I, I understood that there were people around the country actually doing total body scans or cameras and then putting that in in a system to detect cancer. Are we, is that anything in the near future that you think we're going to be seeing? Is AI going to be able to take a picture of you naked on a bed like, <laughs> and, and then tell your doctor whether you have cancer or not? Well, wonderful questions, and, and thank you for thank you for all the wonderful questions. Um, so you are right. So the computers uh, are being used to review testing, and they're also being used for the mammogram images. Because when you look at the mammogram images, it looks like white spider webs. Um, but the computers are good at picking up things. They're not definitive, so it's always well always. At my understanding is currently it's still good to have. The computer do the initial screens. It's like even on our EKGs, the computer can measure the height of the waves and it can measure the width and the timing much faster and much easier than we can. And then we as medical providers will then confirm. Likewise for the mammograms, likewise with the app smears, likewise dermoscopy. So not everybody is a great dermoscopist. It takes a little bit of practice and some of the easy stuff, easy stuff's easy, some of the stuff gets more complicated. There are services where people will actually take those images and because you can save them on your phone or into the electronic health record, they transmit those out and to a specialist who will read those. And yes, they are working with AI to be looking at those uh, findings. Uh, there also is uh, I believe it's an ultrasound technology that is uh, that you can use on some of the lesions, and it will give you an indication if it's a melanoma or not. Um, there's something also called confocal microscopy, where you get a different way of shining light. So you are right; there are wonderful new technologies in terms of how we manage uh, a lot, a little bit of a tangent. So in the old days, when people had you know, 60, 80 moles, some people had a ton of moles. There's something called the familial atypical mole and melanoma syndrome. So those people, if they've got a first degree relative with one with a melanoma, the 90% chance of a third and a half melanoma, if they have two, like a brother and a father that have melanoma, two first degree relatives, they're approaching a 100% lifetime risk of melanoma. So for those people who have 68 moles, we would send them the photo studio. And they would literally photograph every part of their body. They'd, they'd end up with a coffee table book of pictures of themselves. They'd bring this coffee table book in with them. And when we look at their belly or whatever, we could go to page 14 and look at the picture and we look at the belly. It's like, you know, this one's changing. This one looks different. All these others look the same. This one's coming off. I've got the picture of the beast there. I simply have talked about the ugly duckling rule. The one that looks different comes off. Um, there is a mole mapping app. So on your smartphone, you can download this app. It was made by the folks at Oregon Health and Science at University. So you can use your smartphone to take pictures of yourself and map where they are. Now, I, I'm not familiar with the AI just diagnosing uh, spots right off the bat yet. I think you're right in anticipating that there's going to be more and more done through AI and they are using the detail of the endoscopic images 
uh, to be able to pick up on those some of those cues, the polka dot, um, the what's called arborizing of a tree branch like blood vessels, the scale. There's there's more factors that are not that going to. So very good good question. Is there a question over here? I was curious your opinion on shave versus punch of a suspected melanoma. I know I was never shave a suspected melanoma, and then I had heard some conflicting data from a dermatologist. So I was just wondering, uh, especially when you said you saw that one in office and oh, we're going to remove it today, right now. Uh, would you do an excision, a shave, a punch? How would you remove it? Thank you. So that's a great and very common question because there has been an evolution. So it used to be that you had to do a full thickness removal of things that you worried about for melanoma. And in that one slide that had a ton of words on it, buried in that, it says that now the recommendation is to do what's called a deep shave or a saucer foundation, where you cut down, it's when they have like a snow saucer, the one with kids who go down the, the, uh, the hills in the wintertime on the snow. It's about, it's a chunk that's curved like that. So you only need to go about a millimeter deep to get most of these off. So melanomas are deeper than melanoma. So if you find that there's residual pigmentation, you might need to cut deeper. But if you uh, you draw, I, to, I do draw, I draw one millimeter margin, I cut along the dotted lines, and I send that off. It's a lot easier and faster to send that. And most importantly, it is now considered state of the art and a better sampling technique to do the deep shave than it is to do a punch. And then when you consider that some of the spots are bigger, so we're talking about bigger than six millimeters, uh, most of the punches pop out at about eight millimeters. There are some like a full 10 millimeters. Um, but if you've got a spot that's really big, um, that's gonna be a big chunk. And let's say it's two centimeters, 20 millimeters, for that one, a punch of the worst two spots would be a good way to go. But if it's small enough, you just take that flexible razor. Literally, it's a flexible razor blade. I mean, it's like the Gillette straight, not the straight edge, but um, in terms of the long ones, but the little sort of rectangular ones with the little zigzags in the middle. We literally use those type of a razor blade, and you can bend it a little bit and you can cut a curve uh, so you can get a circle out. So that is considered the best way to go after those now. If it's the size that you can do that. Like I said, if it's really big, a couple punches so that you can get the depth. Thank you. Great question. Is there another question over here? I see you standing. Please. From a patient perspective, if I'm going into a physician's office, whether it be my primary care physician or should I have an expectation that I'm going to get a good skin exam at a at a normal physical or not? So you uh, <laughs> the recommendations. So I just read a study that said primary care providers are not asking people with diabetes whether they have depression or anxiety. The implication is, oh my gosh, we're, we're terrible because we didn't ask for patients with diabetes if they had depression or anxiety. And the study said, well, 55% of them do. It's like, okay, well, that is a high proportion of them. So somebody did a study and they said, if a primary care provider did everything that they were supposed to do from everybody's individual studies, it would take, I think it was statistic words, it would take them 26 hours a day to, to take care of the same number of people that they're taking care of. So, uh, you're let's talk. You're fired too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not no joking because I know some folks that do yeah. So, it is a balance, I would say. The welcome to Medicare examination does not even require any physical examination, it is mostly to assess health maintenance things, and also their the hearing and you know depression screen, and the get up and go test to see if people are at risk for falls. So it will depend on your needs. So um, if you're somebody who has a history of pre-cancer or cancerous skin lesions, and you have, or you have those risk factors, then you should plan and schedule to have a thorough skin examination. If you're just going in for your wellness examination, what we found is listening to people's heart and lungs 
when they're not short of breath and not having chest pain, doesn't help them a lot. Um, and so we're we're tailoring our physical examinations a little bit. Um, so does everybody need a head and toe skin examination? I think that people who are at average risk, the studies don't show that we should do that all the time. Um, the studies do show that if there's a concern we should, or if they have less risk, then we should. And in terms of what type of doctors and apologists, of course, are very happy and very skilled at that. And then um, uh, also primary care uh, providers are not as good as diagnosing those skin regions as the dermatologists, but they can get you started. And so it'll, it'll vary. So some of the primary care doctors do a lot of skin stuff and are very comfortable with that. Some of them do more sports medicine. And so they're more comfortable with sports. Some of them are babies, so more comfortable with babies. So you have to find out. And it's one of those things you can call um, like when I shopped around, it's like, hey, your family doctor, how can, you know, are you comfortable with skin stuff? Can you do my skin exam? And it's like, oh, yeah, I do a lot of skin stuff. And so, um, so you can shop around. Did I, I know I waffled, but did I answer your question? Well, I kind of expected for a And I have done that, as you said, when you gone and took it. I took the initiative yeah. to have a skin exam by a dermatologist. Yes. But, I hear other people that talk about, well, I went for my physical and they didn't talk to me about it and I didn't say anything, so I didn't think it was important. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm, I'm thinking as I speak to relatives and friends, how to recommend them to be seen or who they should see. So that is, that's a wonderful re reflection. And I think we've, we've all learned some of that. And you know, I've, I've been at family get togethers and it's like, so maybe a little closer to <laughs> oh, that's a basal cell cancer. I saw my I won't say what type of doctor, but I saw my doctor two weeks ago. They didn't say anything. It's exactly what you said. There was a nurse. It's like, man, let me take a look at that. There was a doctor. I mean, it's like they look at that spot. It's like that's cancer. That needs to come off. Um, so some people have a good eye for seeing those things. Some people are focused on other things. So what we find is whether you're an outpatient or whether you're in the hospital, paying very close attention to what's going on, noting the changes or abnormalities or concerns, and then speaking up about it can be very helpful. Uh, a totally tangential tip is if you have a loved one who's in the hospital or you're in the hospital, if it's at all possible, have a friend, especially if they've got any medical experience at all, or they're just really taking notes and asking questions. Always try to have somebody else with you in the hospital to ask questions, to take notes, because people in the hospital are tired, they're sick. Doctor comes in, or nurse practitioner, or whoever comes in, wakes them up. Hey, how is everything going? Uh, what? <laughs> uh, I guess okay. You know, it's like, well, what did they say? It's like, I don't remember. I mean, it was like five a.m. and they came by and saw them. So it's very helpful to have somebody who can help you. And when they come by with medications, it's like, oh, well, so what's this? It's like, oh, this is your, this is your antibiotic. It's like, I'm going for heart failure. I didn't know I was getting an antibiotic. <laughs> so it's always wonderful if you can uh, to have some help and and really to, to just know everything that's going on. It's like, oh, well, tell me, what kind of tests are we doing? What is that study for? What is this medicine for? So it, um, things are complicated. Uh, and having a good helper should be wonderful. Thank you. Question. And Stryker, when you do a mold surgery, are the skin samples reviewed on site on, uh, at the time of the surgery by a dermatopathologist or not? So you actually have asked two different questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so if I'm in my office, which is the I see patients here at Grace and then my other office, is uh, the a W Med Family Medicine Clinic. When we send our pathology specimens out, those go to Bronson, and I request on the slip that they be reviewed by a dermatopathologist, because the dermatopathologists are the ones that have special training in looking at skin samples. There are wonderful pathologists that specialize in leukemia and blood cancers, and there are other ones who specialize in, you know, 
internal organs and stuff, general pathology, anatomic pathology. I want somebody who knows skin because I get better answers for the skin so that I can make a more definitive treatment. So that's half of your question. The other half of your question is, and let's, I'll use Southwest Michigan Dermatology Associates for an example. They've got three low micrographic surgeons in their practice. So they're a little bit different than a dermatopathologist. They go through dermatology. First, they do a year of a general internal medicine, or it could be family medicine. Then they do another three years of dermatology, and then they do another two years of mode micrographic surgery, learning how to look at those samples underneath the microscope and also learning how to cut and learning how to prepare um, so that they leave as little scar as possible when they take the chunks out of people's faces or the back of their hands and stuff. So they are not technically dramatic pathologists for those micrographic surgeons that are very good at reviewing the skin samples, <coughs> especially related to the next week. The reason I mentioned this is I'm retired right now, but okay. it wasn't too long a few months ago. But question I, I saw I've seen a couple at least one case of uh, and then where a patient did a mole surgery. Yes. And it was in the sample um was not read by a dermatopathologist. So the patient had to come back for another surgery. And then the same thing happened. And it happened. I won't tell you what kinds it happened. Okay. And my concern is that you know, I think it should be done where there's a you know board certified dermatologist, not someone who's had some training, whatever. But a board certified dermatologist should read that. Same with them about breast. If you're going to do a breast biopsy or take out a tumor with uh, that type of technology, that biopsy that's removed should be taken, processed quickly, and read down, read in the next room. By you know, a pathologist who specializes in breast cancer to avoid missing the diagnosis. Um, you know, same when, when a patient goes to the clinic, gets a chest x ray, the nurses or doctors are not see anything. Can I help you? Yeah, all we're looking for are the diagnosis of the pathology. All you're looking at is the mark, third mark, right? You're not looking for so the so the no surgeon. The trainer was the mark. He's yeah. not die, he's not it's already been diagnosed, but I had a case where the patient went through 19 operations, no, nine operations. It was the same thing, I'm finding the margin. Was, why didn't you see the first one? Yeah, but there are nine million of them, but okay. But, and great perspectives. One of the things that you will sometimes see is you will sometimes see uh somebody who's not a most micrographic surgeon. In essence, try to do the same technique where they will cut off the lesion and then they send it off to a pathologist to look at uh, and then and try and get as quick an answer as they can. But then the patient comes back the next day and if they need to take more, then they take more the next day and then they send it off. Some people call that slow modes as opposed to the mode when the doctor surgeon who looks at it right away and then takes additional to make sure the margin is there. So there's, I can't speak exactly to what you experience, um, but that's something that I've seen is that people who aren't those surgeons will sometimes really send it off to the pathologist. And so if you have, a, if you don't have a mode surgeon in your community, if you have a pathologist, you can sometimes coordinate back and forth on that, but the mode surgeons will be more efficient. Though. So thank you so much for being that. Um, how are we, should we wrap up? Stein. Okay. Thank you, everyone. You've been a wonderful audience. We really appreciate everybody coming. I hope it's been helpful. And of course, please don't give us any feedback. Thank you, I've done the blue light spectral two or three times in a minute. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Right. Anyway, I want to thank Dr. Solar very much for everything. And like I said, I've done the blue light spectral a couple of times and it's, it's painful. So I appreciate that very much. And like I say, it, it, it's very close to home. 
Um, April 10th, we're going to have uh, Dr. Palmer, and it is dealing with difficult patient personalities, which should be really, really interesting. <laughs> and, and in October, we're going to have um, children and RSVP, which, which is a hot topic right now. Anyway, thank you. I don't know where Brenda is, but thank you, Brenda, wherever she is, hiding somewhere. She's in, she's in the back. And I think Brenda's going to be here for a long time, so I'll, I'll be lectureship. So please come again. Thank you very much. And have a great evening. Be safe.